Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Jamie Rappaport Clark, President and CEO of Defenders of Wildlife. Founded in 1947, Defenders of Wildlife is dedicated to the protection of all native animals and plants in their natural communities. Jamie has generously agreed to share some of her experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Jamie, for joining us today. Thank you for having me. So why does wildlife require a defender? because of the rate that we're losing them. Uh, we, uh, wildlife is the underlying fabric of everything that's America. Uh, we are very much connected to nature in this country and we are losing very iconic species at rates that are much faster than natural processes. So with climate changing, with habitat destruction, with increasing levels of pollution, the first indicators of the health of our fabric, the health of our country, is seen through the eyes of many of our very precious wildlife species. Is this a, a matter of, in pursuit of our happiness, in pursuit of our own living, we're beginning to impact our environment to such an extent that we're crowding out um, other living organisms? Well, to some extent, that's true. I mean, pursuit of economic development, uh, in search of, of our own success, what happens? We have an increasing population. Uh, the, mm -hmm. the, the, the world is growing in uh, numbers we nobody anticipated. Uh, people also like to live where wildlife live, along the coasts, along the river bottoms, and uh, along the foothills of the mountains. And we have... Uh, a lot of work to do to learn better how to share the same resources with wildlife because um, the, the, the environment, we all depend on the environment, um, whether it's for clean water, clear air, um, economics of, of ecotourism, um, and the wildlife that we are losing, the, uh, which is very much connected to the habitat that we're losing, is uh, going to impact us as a society more and more. Great example, pollinators are probably uh, one of the fastest declining suites of species we have. Um, without pollinators, you would not have the agricultural prowess that we have in this country. Uh, corn, wheat, soybeans all depend on pollination of the insects that, that uh, uh, populate this country. The rampant use, un indiscriminate, um, unregulated use of pesticides are just crashing the populations of pollinators. The changing climate is causing their migratory patterns to shift so that uh, pollinators are migrating at the time when the, the plants are not in bloom. And as we lose pollinators, we are going to see serious impacts on the agricultural um, uh, communities that make up particularly middle America. And so goes agriculture, so goes the economic engines, the farm support for this country. So often the, this discussion is framed in terms of development or not development. Mm -hmm. Is that the proper way to, to, to see this? Is the choice between our own prosperity in defending wildlife, is that, is, is that the dialectic here? No, in fact that's very unfortunate because uh, it, it continues to be set up as a win or lose. Right. Somebody's got to win and somebody's got to lose. And I say it's the balance. What's the right balance? Um, this, this country, Defenders of Wildlife focuses primarily in North America. So Canada, United States, down into Mexico and Latin America. And, and we have watched for decades, uh, we've seen decades of uh, economic prosperity and vital, vital ecological health. So it's finding that balance. We've had many scholars over the years that have connected the health of the environment to the health of society. Um, you've probably heard the term the canary in the coal mine. Right. Um, as, as an indicator of ecological health starts sounding the alarm, we know something's wrong. Um, the the uh, aquatic systems of this country, freshwater mussels, some of the revered fishes of, of, of this country, when they're in trouble, we know it's a water quality problem. And if it's a water quality problem affecting um, suburbia, it's going to be affecting the water health, the aquatic health, the, the, the water needs of society. 
Talk about Defender's mission. Uh, Defender's mission is very holistic. It's, it's, it's interconnected. Um, while we focus on imperiled species, and we're probably best known for our work on gray wolves and grizzly bears and some of the larger predators, larger carnivores, it's really in the end all about habitat. If you protect the habitat that species need to survive, then you're protecting the systems and by virtue of protecting the habitat, you're going to protect the assemblage of species that depend on them. And we do it in, in a number of ways. We have a three-pronged approach, uh, approach to conservation, prevention, protection, and restoration. Um, certainly, we would prefer to be working in the prevention world. Uh, that upstream solution, the upstream management, the upstream conservation initiatives that allow for that balance, that moderation of use. Um, that doesn't always work, and we are well known for our work um, in the protection arena. We have tremendous intellectual capacity and um, capability working with the Endangered Species Act. And then lastly, in the restoration arena, um, uh, sometimes we've gone too far uh, as a society, and we have caused a major disruption in the system. Uh, Yellowstone National Park is a really great example. In the mid-90s, uh, while I was in government, um, we worked with Defenders of Wildlife to restore wolves to Yellowstone National Park. Talk about some of the programs that you've employed mm -hmm. in order to protect these ecosystems. So we do a lot of work on natural resources adaptation. Well, l let me start at the beginning with climate change. Uh, I, I, climate change is an issue that has confounded us all. We see it with the Hurricane Katrinas, the Hurricane Sandys, the, the much more frequent fires out west. Mm -hmm. We know the, the summer seem to be getting hotter, the rain seem to be getting more frequent, um, and we are really seeing it through the lens of species and habitat. It's caused huge increases in the spread of invasive species, invasive species that are swamping and outcompeting our native vegetation. That's causing all kinds of challenges for intact management of ecological systems and, and wildlife. Um, we're seeing it all along the coast where some of our most precious natural systems, national wildlife refuges, national seashores, are being swamped and flooded over and over and over. And that affects the migratory flyways, whether they're out in the ocean or along the coast. And it's starting to really affect the economies of these coastal lands that have booming tourism issues in the summertime. But when the coasts are inundated by hurricanes, they're not there. How do you go about marketing the, the value and, and connecting to people who don't agree with you? Because right. if you're just talking to people who agree with you, right, it's like talking, right. you're, you're talking preaching to, to the yourself, choir, right. you're preaching to the choir. So the, the, the person that you want to convert is somebody who wants his fossil fuel, Mm -hmm. wants it cheap. Mm -hmm. um, and wants it now. Wants it now. Right. And turns a, somewhat of a blind, ignorant eye to what's going on in the Gulf and, and in other places. Mm -hmm. um, you know, drill baby drill and let, let's get that natural gas mm -hmm. out of the ground. And, and if, if we're beginning to see tremors uh, in, in West Texas, then that's, mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not me. Right. Um, if we're seeing the water being uh, contaminated, it's not me. Well, when you're dealing with a society that is increasingly disconnected from nature, um, we aren't growing up on farms and ranches, we're not growing up with a subsistence way of life depending on wildlife to fill our freezers, uh, as was you know, decades ago. Um, people believe clean water comes from taps and clear air, as long as it's clear, it's healthy. Um, and renewable or resources are renewable. So the Deepwater Horizon was a moment in time that's over. Our job is to understand um, uh, people's motivations and what's, of, what, what's important to them. People just want to survive. They want to live. They mm -hmm. want to prosper. They want to pass on um, uh, 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 kind of a, um, a, a healthy underpinning to their own children. Right. Um, where the disconnect is, is understanding that it's more than just life in Washington, D.C., uh, that they need to understand that there's a connection to the health of the environment. And by educating um, and understanding, if we have a common goal of 
long term security and long term i've never met anybody regardless of politics regardless of the challenges that condones extinction that's very jarring to anybody and so we see something like the gulf of mexico and we realize we need to move off of fossil fuels so how do we do that we we lean into renewable energy um, solar wind and and we work really hard to do it smart from the start uh, you make decisions that are cognizant of uh, uh, important wildlife migratory areas important intact habitats and you get to the same goal which is renewable energy or energy energy sources um, uh, um, without huge economic burden but we are at a point where we have choices to make there's no doubt about it. We have to make choices, um, and it's about the next generations. I think this, we are dangerously close to being the first generation that will pass on a lesser quality environment to our successors. Now, this is a, a passion of not only yourself, but it's, it's basically your whole family has, right. has, has been involved. Uh, talk about both your family and also talk about your career. Uh, well, I grew up in the military, and uh, certainly as most military children, you move a lot. And um, being outdoors was a very significant part of my growing up and um, my love of animals, I, whether it was dogs, cats, turtles, birds, whatever. Uh, it was quite, quite um, um, it was a solace to me. I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed being outdoors. and. I realized that the connection, because I was fortunate enough to see so much of our country growing up in the military, it was fascinating to me. Um, I decided to pursue a career in wildlife ecology, uh, wildlife biology. That's what I was educated as, uh, both undergraduate and graduate degrees in wildlife. Um, and I thought I'd stay in the field, you know, working with banding canvasbacks, working with peregrine falcons, uh, chasing white-tailed deer. and and very much loved it. Uh, I had a transformational moment uh, one summer when I was um, selected to take care of five very endangered peregrine falcon chicks in the wild. And I spent nine weeks out with peregrine falcons caring for them and getting them ready to fledge and go out among the wild. And that, that was a very pivotal moment for me when I realized that endangered species needed all the help they could get. And it was a, a, a labor of love. I, I could see it, I could see extinction happening. And I thought that um, it, was a, it was a career trajectory that I wanted to pursue. Well, a moment of, of neglect right. could end up having these five chicks die. Gone. And particularly in those right. days, that would have had an enormous impact right. and you just multiply that neglect out and by thousands you, and you and have you have no peregrine falcons anymore. Right. we were very close to that because of ddt right uh, rachel carson in the 60s sounded those alarms um, so after uh, graduate school i actually went to work for the military i was a very um, unique and uh, lonely wildlife biologist, but uh, the, the military has fabulous lands in this country right. what, for whatever reason, uh, um, uh, geographically and um, operationally, have spectacular natural resources. And, and moving from the military, I transferred to the Fish and Wildlife Service, where I did a lot of work with endangered species and habitat conservation. Did, um, I was very much involved in the northern spotted owls, spotted owls versus jobs, timber versus jobs of the late 90s, and was incredibly fortunate during the Clinton administration to receive a presidential appointment to lead the Fish and Wildlife Service as a career wildlife biologist in the late 90s. Um, with political transition, presidential appointees leave, and I popped out into the, the nonprofit sector, which has been a real eye-opener after 20 years in government, and did some work with groups like the Nature Conservancy and the National Wildlife Federation before finding my way to Defenders of Wildlife, which really spoke to my core um, passions and my core values for conservation. Um, and it, it uh, working with endangered species and habitat. My family is in that world as well. My husband is a fellow wildlife biologist, a career professional, 
um, who now is a professional nature photographer. Uh, our son is um, uh, named Carson after Rachel Carson, a and he too is very much an outdoors kid. We enjoy going to Yellowstone, and he too is a photographer and author of children's books uh, that uh, are dedicated to conservation efforts. Is the nonprofit world easier or more difficult yeah. or different? Uh, certainly different. Uh, and I submit it's way more complex. Um, while the government is a big bureaucracy. It's a behemoth. That, absolutely that. It's very much a behemoth. Um, you're always connected in some way. Uh, somehow you get to the White House, ultimately. And there's always somebody above you. Uh, and there's always, um, there's always a budget. You have to go testify and you have to look for an annual appropriation and, and justify it. But, but the government keeps moving. It's an engine that keeps moving. In the nonprofit world, um, you need to be much more inventive, much more resourceful. Uh, the opportunity to take responsible risk is, is, is very real, and I, I believe the nonprofit sector is much more vibrant. Do you have a theory about the role of government in the environmental movement as to how that should work? Is it a coordinating role? Is it a standards role? Is it a, um, is it a convening role? Um, or is it a, is a direct management role? I think it's all the above. It's all the I above. Mean, the absolute role of the federal government is to steward the environmental laws of this country. They, they are the regulators, whether it's Clean Water Act, uh, the Endangered Species Act. The government is charged with that national lens. And it's, it's, it's very important that they're working very closely with the states. Uh, because there's a very important relationship and collaboration with the states. But species and habitats don't respect political boundaries, and so the federal government is that overarching camera lens. Um, the relationship with the nonprofit, with the non government community, is extremely important because the government can't lobby. Right. Um, right. The, the nonprofit Defenders of Wildlife is a very significant thought partner with the federal government. We can lobby, we can hold the service accountable, we can push the envelope, take responsible risks. Um, criticize. Criticize, um, absolutely, and hold the government accountable, whether it's Capitol Hill uh, and the relevant committees, or it's this, the administration uh, as, as seen through the interior or agricultural departments. But it is a relationship and that's what's important. It, it is, you know, it's a very important three-legged stool. You have the government, you have, this, you have the federal government, you have the states, and then you have the, the community, which is, you know, the environmental community, the conservation community, academia, um, the, the science support. How do you evolve the environmental movement to assure that new generations of Americans who are going to be increasingly uh, diverse, um, having different uh, ethnic, religious, racial, linguistic mm -hmm. backgrounds, um, become engaged in an environmental movement that is uh, so often seen as, as primarily uh, the, the field of play of, of people who are uh, white and reasonably well off. As we um become increasingly diverse as a society, um, it's incredibly important that we represent that incredibly diverse and rich voice. Uh, reaching out to uh, diverse communities, how, what our board of directors looks like, uh, the, the, um, the experts that we employ, um, the um, relationships that we have. Uh, Defenders has a, a fairly robust field component. We have field offices, primarily in the West. Um, and we engage the Latina community in California in rangeland reform and in um, uh, understanding what's important to them, uh, reaching out to Native Americans uh, and uh, working with the Indian colleges uh, or with Indian country to restore bison to right. Montana. It, it is um, ex both experiential and providing the educational tools and the opportunity for exposure. Because everybody, regardless of ethnic background, socioeconomic status, care deeply about um, a rich future for their children. I believe everybody 
regardless of political stripe, um, has a stewardship ethic and moral ethical fabric. We just need to figure out how to catalyze and tap it. Well, this nation is our habitat. This world is. is our habitat. It is. Jamie Rappaport Clark, thank you so much for helping to advance protection of our habitat of the United States of America, and, and thank you for your insights. Thank you. Thanks.